Hello, and welcome to Our World Today, a progressive political show imagining a better tomorrow. I'm Karen Schroffnago, and our show tonight is News, A Different Perspective, with our guests Dave Bicking and Jeff Nygaard. Uh, I want to start by saying something about the hostess of the show for 10 years who died on um, January 20th, January 30th, I'm sorry. Um, so I guess I'm not just sitting in for Suzanne, but um, this show was such an incredible, important piece of Suzanne's life and, and launched so, so much progressive journalism in the Twin Cities. So, so it was very important to me as a dear friend of Suzanne and to, to Jeff and Dave that we, and to Dave Garland, her partner and the director of the show, to, to keep the show going. So, so um, as part of our ongoing remembrance of Suzanne and celebrating her legacy, we intend to keep our world today yeah. on the air. And, um, yeah, it's almost weird uh, because she, in my mind, is so associated with this project. Mm -hmm. yes. I almost think it's weird to be, even be on the air, but <laughs> I know without it, any shred of a doubt uh, that Suzanne would want this show to go uh, on. She definitely no, she was fact, very clear about in fact, that. Yes. It was so, I was so impressed, yeah. even as she, her illness progressed and she became quite ill yeah. toward the end, she was emailing me really yeah. regularly with thoughts and ideas and, and things to do with the show because right. she really wanted it. She always wanted it to just move forward, you know, it's not, right. and like the news. Right. The news right. doesn't stop and we can't stop. So right. in and honor of her, right. I feel like yes. I want to do this show. Oh, definitely. And it's it's been very good doing it all this time. Jeff and I have been doing the show with her for nine and a half years. It's I had one or two shows with her even before that. And um, she's done so much, and not just the Jeff and Dave show, right. but, no. uh, you know, oftentimes four shows a month. Right. Um, with a lot of other wonderful, wonderful guests, people who really need to be heard. And it was really an important part of her life's work during those right. last 10 years or, or more. Um, I first met her a little bit before that, maybe 11 years ago or so like that. Um, a bunch of us took a trip down to uh, Omaha. There was a Stratcom uh, convention oh, yeah. there right. where they were talking about making it acceptable to use um, smaller nuclear weapons. Right. Um, the, tactical nuclear weapons. Right, yeah. The thing was so secret that most members of Congress weren't allowed to go. Of course, we didn't go in that sense either. But, <laughs> but um, we had a bus ride down there together, or a large van with about a dozen people or something like that. And it was a good chance to get to know Suzanne. And she was so much fun on that bus trip. It was just a wonderful, wonderful trip with her. And that's, that's the start of knowing her. And she was really like that. She was awfully right. a lot of fun. Yes. And really... Um, and really dedicated to this, you know, mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, she had always had these feelings and, and stuff, but hadn't been active, as many people have periods in their life when there's other things going. But that uh, trip seemed to inspire her, and it wasn't long before she had started the show, and then, right. you know, a little while longer. After that, I came on, and Jeff, and, uh, and she kept it going so much. It's, it's and so really, important. And she really, really believed in the power of ideas. And, the, right. and, not, not, and I don't think Suzanne or any of us think that talking about the events of the day is what's going to change them. Right. At the same time, the, the consciousness raising that we do a little tiny bit in, mm -hmm. on this show and with our world today is, is part of a struggle, a, a movement for social change because until we kind of get into what's, well, as the saying I like is always, if, if what we think affects what we do, then we better work on what we think. Yeah. Yes. And that's what Suzanne was always about, like, well, what's right. really going on here? Well, let's talk about what's really happening. You yeah. Know? And that's yeah. what, we, what the, the tradition yeah. I think I want to try to right. carry forward. Yeah, know? keep that up because, Not that we yeah, know because what's really going on. the media <laughs> we has, the media, and we, you know, mostly analyze the media on this show, but the media has so many warped ideas that we can pick up and that most people do pick up. And it's very natural for people to pick them up when there's so little to say otherwise. And Suzanne helped bring out those other views. So we'll miss her terribly. And uh, yeah. we thank uh, Karen very much yeah. for standing in and doing this. And well, I have done taking this in over the past. Some more. Yes, yeah. of course Suzanne you have. Suzanne launched right. my television career <laughs> by, by the one year when she went to Brazil. I covered oh, for right. her. Yes, yeah, right. she, sure. did, she did. That's why I'm, I, we have to tell our, our viewers that she's right. no longer with us because sure. this is the time when she would, she would be in, in Brazil, in Brazil. Right, yes. and they're used to her not right. hosting the show right. over the winter. So, yeah, um, so just to put out there that um, this is, but this show is, is a part of her legacy. Right. So right. headline number one, 
Suzanne Linton is no longer with right. us, but her legacy, Our World Today, will continue. Right. So headline no. number two, Headline number Jeff. two. <laughs> well, there's a number of, we always try to start with a few little headlines, and, and one of the uh, things I should have mentioned last month, because it technically happened in December of 2014, but on December 15th, this was ignored in the U.S. press, there was a general strike, a national general strike in Belgium. Wow. The headline wow. in the Agence France press report was, National Strike Paralyzes Belgium. And the London Guardian reported, Belgium was brought to a standstill by a 24-hour general strike as the country's powerful unions grounded air, rail, and sea links and forced businesses, wow. schools, and government offices to close. Jacobin, a new U.S. news site, reported that the action, which topped off two months of protests and regional industrial action, was coordinated in response to the raft of austerity measures being enacted by Belgium's new government, a right-wing uh, government. The measures include raising the pension age, freezing wages, and cutting public services, which of course is what's happening all over Europe, especially in the south, in Spain, in Greece, in Italy, uh, uh, Belgium also, uh, as a part of the, the sort of, uh, I don't even know how to characterize the, the regime of the European Union where they're trying to enforce uh, that austerity uh, program. S on, a, on a good news, it, uh, last, just last month, on January 25th, uh, the Greeks elected Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras of the left-wing Syriza party. A very, well, Syriza has plans to take actions to relieve the suffering that the Greek people have been experiencing under the austerity program. And they're really uh, an alternative. There's an, when we say the left yeah. party in Europe, it's not like well, do we even Democrats. refer to a left party? <laughs> I, guess, I guess the media refers to the no Democratic Party as a left party. Right, yeah. 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 There's no, right. But in, in, in this case, it really is left. They're talking about a massive uh, uh, jobs program. Uh, they're talking about, well, if people don't know, um, the, in, Greece was in big trouble in 2010, especially, when they're talking about defaulting on their, some of their bonds. And so the, the Troika, the, e the International Monetary Fund, the Eurozone countries, and the European Central Bank stepped in and loan them a whole bunch of money on condition that they take undertake these really draconian yeah. austerity measures and that's what Sir Syriza party is coming in to, to overthrow right. and again the the media in in the US has covered a little bit the election itself but the organizing that went into uh, uh, going against the tide and in fact the the well, the reason I think it's important is um, they're asking for a forgiveness of a large part of that debt and it's being portrayed as a big threat to the European Union. Uh, in fact, um, the, uh, financial, the London Financial Times says that uh, even a negotiated default would bring about a, quote, breakdown in trust between members of the European Union that would make it much harder to keep the European Union together. So yeah. this idea that, that there, there's, it's a fragile alliance, and the European Union, of course, is just really a corporate uh, structure to try to compete, uh, you have European, uh, Corporations compete with the big, the big boys, the U.S. Yeah. and Japan, especially. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the, the, the Financial Times forgets the, the London Debt Conference of 1953, which, as the BBC reported, was when half of Germany's post-World War II debt was written off, leading to a sharp increase in economic growth. And as oh. they said, if it happened for Germany, it could happen for Greece. That's what Syriza says. Right. So that's a big right. election, to that what's happening yeah. in Greece. Uh, and the fact is the media hasn't portrayed much about what's led up to this. And, exactly. you know, like we were saying with the show, combating some of those ideas and other ideas, the thing that's made this possible is for the Greek people to say there is another alternative. Exactly. Because if you just read the U.S. media, if you read the dominant stuff, Greece has to do this. I mean, it's been presented right. as something they have no choice in whatsoever. Right, right, and right. people are saying, maybe we do have a choice. We'll see whether they can exercise that choice. Mm -hmm. There is no alternative. Uh, right. There's th three little headlines on climate. I'll make them real quick. Um, one is the, um, the sea level rise study that came out on January 15th. Uh, in the Star <coughs> Tribune, the headline was, it's interesting how it was reported. <laughs> in the Star Tribune, the headline was, sea level rise is overstated. Mm -hmm. In the Washington Post, the headline read, the rate of sea level rise is far worse than previously thought. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, they're both true in the sense that there has been a measurement problem in the past that showed that sea level I is a slightly less than uh, what they were saying. But that, what that means is the levels they're at now are actually more, more, an a more extreme growth oh, right. rise than, from, than the baseline. So uh, what the paper shows is that sea level acceleration 
over the past century has been greater than it had been estimated by others. It's a larger problem than we initially thought, the authors of the study said, and the acceleration into the last two decades is far worse than previously thought. This new acceleration is about 25% higher than previous estimates. Uh, second climate headline is climate change. Uh, uh, major story was that the 2014 breaks the heat record, challenging global warming skeptics. Right. So 2014 yeah. was officially the, uh, the warmest year in recorded history. Right. And um, one of the um, s authors of the study was quoted in the New York Times. I'm proud of the Times for publishing this comment. Climate change is perhaps the major challenge of our generation. And the third uh, climate-related story was the, a report on uh, January 16th, the next day, ocean life faces mass extinction. And due to, uh, mostly due to human activities like over-harvesting, uh, bottom uh, trawlers who, who drag their nets across the bottom and wreck <coughs> coral reef and things like that, um, a lot of uh, uh, habitat basically in the oceans as well as uh, chemical imbalances, acidification due to global warming, but also uh, nitrate overloading which results in dead zones like we have uh, by the right. Gulf of Mexico, in the Gulf of Mexico near New Orleans, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're, they're talking about we might be reaching a tipping point with a major extinction event yeah. on the scale of, of the losing the dinosaurs. So um, the yeah. story of our generation I is right. right. Um, the, my last little headline is Social Security, the, on the very first day of the new uh, Republican-led Congress in, uh, in early January, the, the, they in a technical move, the, uh, the Republican-led Congress voted to um, put up a barrier to transferring money between the Social Security Disability Fund and the general fund. The general, uh, the, the retirement fund is much larger than the disability fund, and there's a cash flow problem um, largely related to the recession, which a lot more people claim disability in the recession. Um, so um, they basically precipitated a crisis by saying that uh, the shortfall that's come up, which has been addressed almost a dozen times in the past by just borrowing money from the general fund to fund the Social Security disability, yes. has now been banned by the Republican-led mm -hmm. Congress, pr prompting sort of a, a, a or looks like it could be a crisis, a funding mm -hmm. crisis, similar to the requirement that the post office was I imposed was going to say. Uh, right. Where <laughs> they had to pre-fund for 75 years. Do they want to destroy right. something. Right. And suddenly it's a crisis because they're asked to do these outrageous things right. that aren't really necessary. Right. But then you promote a crisis and then you say, oh, look, it's broken. We better get rid of it, whether right. it's the Postal Service or Social Security, which has been in the crosshairs of conservatives for quite a while. So those are my headlines for the yeah. month. We just we were going to throw Afghanistan into the headlines. Oh, good heavens. In. That's right. So. Yeah. Uh, on January 29th, uh, it was announced that um, every thing, every dollar that the United States spends in Afghanistan, and remember, although officially we, our combat operations in Afghanistan are finished, we still have over 10,000 troops doing, well, that's the point. <laughs> doing what? We don't know, because <laughs> as of uh, January um, 29th, all reporting on the uses of U.S. funds in Afghanistan, which are billions and billions and billions, is classified. Even innocuous things like the amount of money we're spending on I literacy training for s s uh, military recruits, it's classified. There's no information available to anybody. Now, this should be, you'd think, this is the kind of story that, that the media, in many contexts, gets really worked up about because this is their job. They want right. access to those numbers because that's, that's what they do. They right. report that stuff, and, they, and, and especially when it's as easy as getting attending a Pentagon press conference in Afghanistan right. and right. just w tell people what, they, what we say. You know, it's yeah. kind of almost a propaganda conduit. Yeah. Now they're just saying any reporting of this is off limits, even wow. every dollar, basically. So yeah. it's a, kind of a big deal for media watchers, and if people are concerned about this, you might want to contact your local uh, media outlet and say, how come we're not hearing anything about where our tax dollars are going in Afghanistan? Even how many there are. Yes. Wow. You know, we don't know. So that's another, uh, you're right, I'm glad you reminded me, that's another little headline of the month that just was announced with little fanfare. In fact, I think it was on the inside pages yeah. of the Times on the 29th right. of January. We wish the media would get a little more worked up about some of these <laughs> things. Right. But they've realized that, you know, they've lost access to these figures. Mm -hmm. But if they make too much of a deal of it, they lose access to the press conferences, to the press releases, to all the other things that the government feeds them as very, very easy media. It's so easy to report on something when we're told exactly what the story is for you to uh, report on. And, and here's where I think it's worth mentioning, too, the, the, the 
importance of popular uh, agitation around these issues mm -hmm. because if we have enough sentiment that whistleblowing is a positive thing and mm -hmm. something that the U.S. public benefits from, then we know there are people in the Pentagon establishment in Afghanistan who know these numbers and could leak them. Right. You know, and there are reporters who will publish them or will at least receive them. Right. But uh, that's a highly, well, as we can see huh. from Chelsea Manning and, and Snowden and others, um, it's a very, very dangerous and risky thing to do. You basically, mm -hmm. well, it's a big decision. Mm -hmm. So without popular uh, support and agitation saying, we're behind you mm -hmm. if you do this. We want this kind of information because mm -hmm. um, the media <coughs> as an institution right. probably isn't going to do it. Uh, they'll be, like I said, they would receive that information and could distribute it, and they might do right. it if there's enough popular will to f bring forward a whistleblower and put it online. So we really, as, as a media activists, you know, those are the kind of things why it's important, not just for the, for the sake of Edward Snowden, to support uh -huh. Edward Snowden or Chelsea Manning or whoever, but to create an environment in which whistleblowers are valued and, and, and we encourage them to come forward because we say people like you are needed and valued. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's so where the media can receive <coughs> information. Right. We have to generate that information by right. activism. As right. a media organization that watches the media, I think we maybe should comment a little on the, the Brian well, Williams yeah, story. The, oh, Brian when, Williams. Big, when the, the media, big media becomes the story. The, right. The media has its own story here yeah. about shocking. <laughs> we were lied to about the war in Iraq. Oh, wait yes. a second. No. This now that's they're surprise. not talking about that. <laughs> we were lied to about the personal experience of one embedded reporter yeah. in Iraq, and you know, I mean, Brian it's quite Williams remarkable. Is an anchor, right, well, a news anchor. Right, he Brian is, Williams. He, right. Well, at the time, at the time, he was just rep he was embed an embedded reporter. Was he anchoring? I think he was. Right? I think he, I think he time? was at yeah. that time. Okay. Yes, but in any case, um, um, it's it's quite remarkable because. Now the, something has to be done about this this lie, and this was right in I think today's and yesterday's mm -hmm. news that he's now going to be suspended for six months, and so and there's a lot of argument back and forth as to whether that's you know right or wrong or anything like that, and virtually no context given in any of these things because it talks about the lie that Brian mm -hmm. Williams told, right. and Brian Williams has told other lies, you know, directly about his own personal experience, which. Some of those are beginning to come out. Whether they'll come out in the major media, I don't know. And of course, as an anchor, he's read the lies of other people right. over and over and over and over again in ways that he must clearly have known right. were lies. But that is his job, after all. So it must seem a little bit to him, well, I've, I've just been doing my job. As embedded reporters, they were supposed to glorify the war. Right. That's why they were embedded reporters. And a little embellishing here and there seems pretty minor to the, to the major things they got wrong about that war. But Brian Williams has done other ones, uh, particularly, I understand, uh, during Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. so 2005, I believe, so we're coming up on 10 years. Yeah. And um, he told stories of being, you know, there on the scene in Hurricane Katrina, and he had guardsmen, you know, um, protecting him from all sides because he would have surely been shot, and their vehicles would have been taken, and all rampant this rampant lawlessness, and, uh, rampant lawlessness, and there were bodies everywhere. I mean, just bodies everywhere, and people shooting everywhere, creating more bodies everywhere. It was really mm -hmm. hyped up as to what was going on. That was all a lie. Mm -hmm. As it turned out, when now uh, the dust cleared, uh, the not dust, or <laughs> the water clear. Right, right, right. Yeah, yes. that there were some people killed, um, but it was a much, much smaller number. And the like main story, mm -hmm. right, the main story about Katrina was the people who had cooperated, who had done what they could for other people, and it was not about looting and killing. Mm -hmm. right. But these were black people, of course. Right. And so this story was not just a lie, it was a very racist lie. And one that much more than whether he was shot down in the helicopter, the person in front of him was shot down in a helicopter, has little bearing on the actual conduct of the war. But in people's perceptions of what went on in New Orleans, yeah. this story and this representation, which he was not alone in, um, have far, far more effect mm -hmm. to this day in terms of what do people think will happen in times of dire need like this. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's a lie of his own. But of course, the whole war in Iraq was a lie. I mean, 
it, it was generally known by people who were paying attention at that time that there were, of course, no weapons of mass destruction. It's not like we found out suddenly, oh my goodness, there's no weapons of mass destruction. There was plenty of reason to know and, that at the and time. And in defending Brian right. Williams, the higher-ups have been saying, you know, that there's no bigger supporter of the war, that he's never <sighs> questioned any of the money right. for the war, as, <laughs> as if this is Thank the you. defense, right. yes. you right. know? Right. I mean, right. the, yeah. shock, it's shocking. Right. As you say, this mm -hmm. is the... This this right. is the bigger story, right, exactly. right. is that the network, you know, <laughs> right. and all the networks right. are, you know, thrilling, thrilled ch to, to champion war and more money for war. And, right. and, 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 and you know what? They're still doing it. Exactly. And, well, and we the, are seeing that now. I was going to say part of the build up, for, part of the uh, role of media, uh, and again, when we say role of media, I don't think we're talking about directly taking marching orders. It's just right. the, the way reporters are socialized to fit right. into the right. information environment uh, is to make sure we understand that there's a major threat mm -hmm. that justifies the most powerful military uh, in the world, in the history of the world perhaps, uh, yeah, going to work. Yeah. And uh, we're s I think we're s one of the places we're seeing that, of course, now, well, a couple of places. One is Syria, yep. where we're talking, just even as we speak, we, we, there's a debate going on about m further militarizing uh, U.S. Right. inserting more military forces and weapons into Syria and Ukraine as well. Right. And the threats in both cases, well, right. and the threats in Syria seem to morph and change a lot. <laughs> and in Ukraine, the, the big bad uh, ogre of Russia and mm -hmm. Putin, especially as a, as a crazed dictator or yes. military, I'm not sure, right. but cr both Ukraine and Syria, I think are extraordinarily um, serious stories because those of us old enough to remember the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, when, when, there's a, when there's a lot of dry wood around, it doesn't take yeah. much of a spark to really, really set things off right. in a bad direction. Well, or, yeah. well, even in the region, think of the, the, uh, the assassination of 1914 uh, in, of Archduke Ferdinand right. in Sarajevo. Right. And that started, to that right. point, the worst war the world has ever seen. You know. right. So we're in dangerous waters here. Right. And that, of course, that assassination wasn't the cause of World no. War I, mm. but it it's sparked spark. it. And we have a lot of causes sitting around right now and a lot of sparks that are yeah. being carelessly thrown around. Yeah. And the, the patterns involved in this from the Iraq War on are several. And that people, to analyze what's going on in the media, what they're being told in the media, need to remember how some of these other wars were uh, brought about. I mean, in Iraq, it was very much demonizing Saddam Hussein. In Syria, it's very much about demonizing Assad. Both um, people who used to be allies of the United right. States, right. incidentally, um, you know, who were, were quite useful to the United States at one time. Saddam Hussein to um, launch a war against Iran back in the early 80s. Uh, a terrible, terrible eight-year war. Yeah. Uh, was just one of the most bloody and, and awful wars and the chemical weapons and all that. He did that as a friend of the United States mm -hmm. because we were against Iran because that was shortly after the Iranian Revolution against the, the Shah. Um, you know, Assad also, you know, you don't have to be a friend of Assad to point out that he has also been quite useful to the United States. His government was one of the ones who brought in um, people who were being rendered to be tortured mm -hmm. on our behalf. Yeah. Um, you know, not a story that the United States wants to talk about a whole lot. But... Um, once again, you don't have to be a friend of some of these people in these countries to recognize the uses of demonizing them. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not many world leaders that you couldn't demonize. People don't get to that role in mm -hmm. life without stepping on a lot of toes, without a lot of ambition, but a lot of ruthless ambition in most cases. And that certainly is true for Putin as well. But why are some of these people demonized and why does it happen at a certain time? Mm -hmm. It's when the United States is preparing war against them. Um, they've well, not uh, always been the such demons. In the case of Syria, too, the, a lot of their opposition to Assad is, it, it puts the United States in a very interesting situation because a lot of the opposition is people who the United States officially would never ally with, but it, we're already, by, by de facto supporting them, and talking about going in actively and bombing some of the positions uh, of Assad positions, right. uh, we're, we're, we're allying ourselves with forces that are offshoots or members of Al-Qaeda. Right. So it really becomes very, uh, you start, start 
try to figure out what's the rationalization for this in terms of official policy. I don't think anybody right. can figure right. it out. Yeah. And the I media mean, uh, has to be, right. I mean, that's where the media, uh, a free, fully functioning media, who's concerned with preserving international order and peace, would be really digging and saying, where are the contradictions here? What are we supporting? What are we, what are we doing here? Right. And uh, I think most people, if you walk down the street in the United States and ask them, what's going on in Syria? Boy, people are confused, I think, because it's, and it is confusing. It's, it it's, is a, confusing. it's a complex situation, but the media doesn't deal with complex situations right. very well. Either. Right, and one of the things that is a pattern that we're seeing throughout these wars is just that, the confusion, the, the right. just total falling apart of everything, the chaos and the destruction. Because if you look at America's wars in the last 15 years, what has been the outcome of these wars? Has it ever been, ah, a new flourishing democracy? Hmm. No. It's been, an, in fact, it hasn't even been, ah, a newly subservient colony. <laughs> no, it isn't even that. It's chaos. It's chaos. And, you know, after you have created a chaos, well, 1998 in, in Yugoslavia, breaking it up into little countries that can't possibly survive on their own, right. to um, Afghanistan, where clearly the, the, the situation is chaos. There is no functioning government that has any kind of control over its own territory. But they are producing 90% of the world's heroin. So right, yes, happening. right, which, which we normally consider to be a criminal and lawless <laughs> activity, except when we participate in it. Um, you look at, of course, Libya, which has created nothing but chaos nothing in that chaos. country. I'm missing one here somewhere. Uh, of course, Syria, very much so. Well, Somalia, obviously, oh, yeah, yeah. has been recognized for years to be a failed state. Mm -hmm. And the United States has had a lot of involvement in that. And we've encouraged Ethiopia to invade when it looked like a government might actually arise mm -hmm. in Somalia. And all these things, it seems to be, if this is the result over and over and over again, you begin to wonder if it's the goal. Mm -hmm. right. When you have the world's most powerful country, the world's most powerful military that has ever existed in the history of this world, and all of your results seem to be opposite to your stated goals, it's time for people to question what those goals are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you want just plain dominance, chaos is a pretty nice thing, mm -hmm. regardless of the absolutely awful cost in human lives and just um, the functioning of society in these countries. Chaos is the thing that really seems mm -hmm. predominant among this. The other thing is created enemies. Mm -hmm. Because we talk about, oh, now ISIS, the, well, ISIS arose from, you know, the chaos in Iraq. But, you know, the foundations of that, uh, we're now looking for some military authorization, or we had a military authorization of any country that was involved in the creation or support of, of Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. We only have to look back to 1979, actually, in the Carter administration, when it was the stated goal and the practice of the United States to start forming a fundamentalist Islamic opposition to the government in Afghanistan at that right. time. The United States did it, not openly, because after all, the fundamentalist, fundamentalist um, 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 Islamic forces that came from all over the Islamic area, you know, from Saudi Arabia, from all the Middle East and stuff, came together despite differences in cultures and language and became one fighting force in Afghanistan. That doesn't just happen overnight and by accident. That was fostered, but the United States officially had a hands-off policy and funneled the money through um, Pakistan's equivalent to the uh, CIA, and a lot of the money came from our very, very good friend and ally, Saudi Arabia, who is still a very, very good friend of, and ally of ours and of ISIS. Mm -hmm. um, who is still funding these things. Well, who, I think you know, 15 out of the 19 uh, 9 11 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. Right. And there's, there's just been new developments in the trial that's been going on for what, 12 years or something regarding the Saudi Arabia funding of, of that operation. So we have these same forces. Those Islamic forces from Afghanistan became active in Kosovo in, as part of Yugoslavia. And they were our allies. They have become our allies in many of these places, and now we look at ISIS, who we're about to declare war against, and we find that part of the strategy, U.S. strategy, is to have a no-fly zone in Syria. 
but a no-fly zone is only effective against those forces that have an air force or aerial power, mm -hmm. which is the Syrian government, which is the strongest enemy of oh, our gosh. supposed enemy. Right. Mm -hmm. This is a recipe for, at best, chaos. Well, I also think yeah. when you talk about uh, goals, that the, the, one of the ways the media falls down is we tend to, the, the propaganda environment says that the goals of the United States are always some virtuous, it has to do with values and what yeah. we support and, right. and the rule of law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, then you look at, well, let's go back to Greece for a second. Yeah. Um, not only is Sir, the Syriza party uh, in Greece that just won the election, not only are they talking about debt renegotiation and uh, jobs programs and things like that, they're also um, allied and support, the, the, the prime minister especially, is a friend with, with Russia. And also Greece is a member of NATO. Yeah. And remember NATO, so, so I think one of the things that, that we, we lose out on when we focus on you know, how we're supporting good things and values and all that stuff is the geopolitics of it and how right. the, the reason we're supporting some of these places is, is uh, not just because of their policies or whatever, it's because of where they fit in the risk game mm -hmm. that the United States is playing. So w w I'm a little worried about Greece in the sense that, because as a member of NATO, an uh, ally, would-be ally, of, we'll see how it goes, with Russia, uh, they're opposed to U.S. Uh, Im uh, sanctions against Russia and opposed to right. U.S. arming of, of uh, Ukrainian forces the against this, the, uh, the rebels in, in eastern Ukraine. So I think that if Greece gets their hands on that and they're a member of NATO, then I, I want to mention, too, if we can go back 70 years, mm. uh, Greeks remember, if the United States people don't, if we ever knew, that after World War II, when there was a civil war in Greece to say who's going to actually right. run this place now that the war's over, yeah. the, commun the communists, who had really been the biggest fighters against fascism. Yes, in, they, were, in, they, were the the who, who they were the ones the who pushed the Nazis, out, pushed right. Nazis yes. out. And the United States actively subverted that in favor of putting in a, a very repressive fascist government right. that was in place for years after World War II. Greeks remember that. And yes. so when we talk about uh, having a left-wing party allied with Russia, uh, uh, looking, looking like it's going to be in opposition to some of the U.S. geopolitical goals in Eastern Europe as a NATO member, well, then maybe start time to start getting our solidarity forces in action for Greece because uh, the United States, who knows what right. they'll do. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this is, this is, I mean, we have a situation in the media, I've, I've pointed out a couple of times, that when we talk about, you know, crimes and things or, you know, the alleged perpetrator of this, and uh, the word alleged is used often, as it should be, in cases of actual things that may be factual or not. Mm -hmm. right. But when the media says Obama believes this yeah. or McCain thinks <laughs> they this, don't say allegedly. they don't say that they allegedly believe this or allegedly think this. And they don't and know yet, what they think. No, they don't know what they think. You know, we use that at a time when the trial hasn't happened yet and we don't know the facts. Mm -hmm. right. We don't know the actual thoughts right. and beliefs of the people in power, but we can presume what they are by what they do, right. because as we talked earlier, beliefs lead to actions, mm -hmm. and the results of what they do. Right. Because again, just the supposed goals, I mean, the United States hasn't achieved one of its supposed goals in a heck of a long time. Mm -hmm. But it's achieved a lot of other things where it seems like no matter how much we try to do for the poor and oppressed people of the world, over and over and over again, we fail miserably right. and geez, the rich get richer hmm. and the corporations dominate. What an, what an awful surprise, oh. what an absolute failure yeah. our foreign policy is. <laughs> so to look at the media and see what it says about what our leaders think or do is really to lose the history which you know shows that this has almost never been true in the past. Well, that really the stated good. goals are the real goals. The media gave us a great example uh, during the past month in January. Two two events happened. Well, actually, one happened in December uh, when the United States announced its opening to Cuba, mm -hmm. and the whole. But the coverage subsequent to that, since the delegation went, I think in early January yeah. to Cuba, the U.S. delegation, uh, and the, the whole, all the reporting and all the official propaganda is that the reason we're doing it is because this is going to accelerate change to make Cuba more like we are. Mm 
That's, 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 that would be a success. That's the goal right. of right. U.S. policy. This is just a change in, in strategy, really, but it's the same goal. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, right while that was happening, King Abdullah uh, of Saudi Arabia passed away and, and handed off the reins of power to his, his nephew, I forget. Yeah, in a, in a democratic uh, process, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. but, and and, and, and <laughs> the, a monarchy. To, wa to watch the media's yes. reporting on those two events right. where we're, the focus is on Cuba, which has been, it appears on the list of terrorist supporting states in the United States, and they're, they're all about human rights and repression and dictatorship, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, a real repressive dictatorship that's yeah. one of our strongest allies in the world, Saudi Arabia, was, re in fact, Obama went out of his way to stop personally to pay his respects to King Abdullah yes. on the way back from a trip to East Asia, I think. Um, so just to watch the difference in coverage w of the United States behavior toward and support of a real repressive dictatorship. Uh, and I talk about, we, the United States often talks about, in the region, supporting the rights of women. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's n probably no country in the world where the rights of women are trampled on more viciously than Saudi Arabia. Right. There's some competition for that. Yeah, it's uh, you know, yes. <laughs> but it's, it's but one of the yeah. worst. It's, it's yes. in the top ten. Yes. And, uh, and you know, Cuba, of course, is a whole different story. And uh, do we ever hear any of the good news from Cuba? Um, right. Never. Yeah. It's virtually because yeah. they're an official enemy, right. official friend. Yeah, we so anyway, watching their the leader. media, right. the, the propaganda is predictable. Like you said, you know, right. if you look at what we've actually done, you can predict all this stuff. But the media yeah. tends to to report what's being said uh, right. by officials, and then reporting that that that's closely related to reality uh -huh. in yeah. some way. Right. When actually, it's yeah. these are uh, uh, propaganda right. functions for the most part. Right. And this propaganda, again, I encourage people to pay more attention because I think we are in a particularly perilous time, and I say that carefully because we've been on the show for 10 years and I don't want to, you know, predict, you know, always gloom and doom. But when you look at the situation where, you know, we're now calling for a new authorization of the use of military force against um, ISIS, this is something that doesn't happen all that often. And it authorizes a lot of things that we're already doing, which is kind of the opposite way to things would be. But these authorizations have always been that way. The supposed authorization would supersede the 2002 authorized use of military forces, which has backed up the war in Iraq all this time. Um, obviously, we've gone far beyond what's explicitly allowed in that particular authorization. But now they're proposing that that one be canceled and this new one, which has no geographic limits whatsoever, but go after them wherever they may be and wherever they go, which is why we can you know, bomb people in Yemen and whatever else, um, which is, if you look at the map, quite some distance from Syria. Well, um, we have been doing that. That's, again, we've been doing that all along. I so, mean, the drones yeah. are everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. So these authorizations, though, I think do mean something in terms of the intentions going forward right. to, to have these in place. And it's notable that the new authorization does not supersede the 2001 authorization for military force in Afghanistan. I want to that point out, too, on. in the propaganda realm, just again, it, these things get so readily and universally adopted by the media that it kind of gets, it's hard to notice it. But the, prop, the term itself, authorization for the use of military force, used to be called. A declaration, declaration of, of war. war. That's right. Yes. And, That's and right. To, de to debate right. a declaration of war yeah. uh, is a different, different yeah. propaganda exercise than right. in this a sanitized term escalation or authorization mm -hmm. by the use of military force. Good so point. I think that's really, uh, it's kind of like we don't have a military escalation where we're right. going, we have surge. You know, yes, right. A surge sounds kind of like something. Escalation kind of sounds something. like something we yeah. did back about 40 um, years ago. Ooh, geez. Well, we so, used to have a war yeah. department. You yeah, know, exactly. <laughs> the Department yeah, yeah. of Defense. When it but I, I do think, too, uh, it's really interesting in the propaganda environment mm -hmm. because at the same time where we're not declaring war mm -hmm. officially in any right. sort of legal way, which right. we're supposed to, we right. are constantly declaring war. There's a war on terror, mm -hmm. there's a war yeah. on drugs, there's yeah. a war on crime, there's a war on right. whatever. The, the, the ideology of intervention is locked into our rhetoric, right. but the, the legal, and we like to proclaim we're a nation, nation of laws, laws right. Right. But, but the legal authorization, uh, the declaration of war, which Congress has the sole power to do, right. I mean, right. except in the short term. The president can authorize right. a short term right. limited, right. I think it's 90 yeah. days or yeah, 180 like days that, yeah. or something. But beyond that, it's Congress's job. 
So it isn't really an authorization of the use of military force. Yeah. It's a declaration of war. Is yes. that what yeah. we want to do? Do we want to declare war on Syria? And who in Syria? Right. You know, it's, just like, it's a civil war. Yeah. And keep in mind, there are many acts of war beyond bombing. Mm -hmm. There's many things Absolutely. defined in international law as acts of war, a blockade of any sort. I mean, Say the so, one so had many had of the Cuba things. Uh, exactly. Yes, many of what we've exactly. been doing in Cuba, we have been at a state of war with Cuba for over 50 years now by the international definition, the sanctions against Russia, um, some of those constitute an act of mm -hmm. war, which is a pretty serious thing when it's against the other major nuclear superpower. Um, you know, so those acts of war are going on all the time. But these are being done now, and in Ukraine, uh, this is, I think, particularly dangerous because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we used to talk about poking the bear um, and, uh, you know, referring to Russia, and certainly, um, we are doing that at this point. There was a resolution in Congress that passed with, I think, 11 dissenting votes, um, uh, strongly condemning the actions of the Russian Federation, et cetera, et cetera, policy of aggression against neighboring countries, aimed at political and economic domination. Well, you um, we should know something about that. <laughs> yeah, we should know something about that. And it goes on with a pages and pages of whereases. Mm. But one, for instance, is uh, the Russian Federation's forcible occupation and illegal annexation of Crimea. Um, well, that can be looked at in a number of different ways. Crimea had been part of Russia traditionally until, uh, you know, it became part of Ukraine back when the Russia and Ukraine were the same country. Right. You know, it's kind of like seeding, you know, maybe maybe up, Upper Michigan should actually be part of Wisconsin, right. mm -hmm. you know, which right. kind of makes sense. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now, if, if the um, Wisconsin and some neighboring states had seceded to form a fascist country, you'd think maybe the people in Upper Michigan would say, you know, we'd kind of rather <laughs> stick with Wisconsin. I mean, yeah, I mean if I'm Michigan, I'm sorry, right. had become, you know, a fascist mm -hmm. country uh, of its own. People in Upper Michigan might say, you know, we've always been closer to Wisconsin, Wisconsin really. Yes. yes. So, um, and it goes on with whereas, as many of them are just absolute falsehoods, many of them are extremely controversial, and yet 11 dissenters. Mm -hmm. And it has several pages of be it therefore resolved and all kinds of actions taken against um, Russia for this, um, a number of which would be considered declarations of war. And this thing, as I say, just passed through Congress. Mm -hmm. These a are dangerous developments. Of war or authorization of oh, the Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still stuck in the past, aren't yeah. I? We're also told a lot, and of course, the humanitarian stories come out whenever it's right. uh, useful. When it's and again, yes. people should look at this. I heard one on uh, NPR back a, f a few days ago talking about the refugees in the Ukraine. And it's a terrible situation. Yeah. Right. A million to a million and a half people yeah. displaced. I mean, it's the, the, the eastern part of Ukraine is being destroyed by a, basically a civil war, while the western part of Ukraine is being destroyed by totally giving in to um, uh, the demands of the bankers. Yeah. So, you know, all of the country is in terrible shape. Yeah. We have a situation where it's indisputable that the United States played a major role in the coup in Ukraine a little mm -hmm. less than a year ago. And now it's just being talked about right now about providing uh, heavy weapons to the government right. of Ukraine to use in their side of what really is a civil war of secession, I guess you could mm -hmm. say, because the people in eastern Ukraine, and I think rightly so, are terrified about what's going to happen to them in a country that is now dominated by forces that are much more closely aligned to Hitler and the Nazis mm -hmm. than they are to Western democracy. Wow. Um, there's a lot of examples of that, the militia operating in eastern Ukraine on behalf of the government in Kiev uh, has a number of battalions which use Nazi insignia. And again, just like in Greece, people in Ukraine remember World War II. Yeah. It was a little more dramatic than it was even for us. And, you know, people in the United States still remember back to mm -hmm. World War II. But in a case where their country was largely overrun by fascist forces with a large internal fifth column of people in the Ukraine who supported those fascist forces, to see those come back mm -hmm. is extremely, I mean, they know what has happened to people in those situations. So we have these stories of, you know, the... Um, people who, uh, refugees who've been displaced. And there was one on, say, on NPR, it was poetic in its elegance, you know, uh, uh, about how, you know, the, the situation of the people there. 
One of the things that never mentioned is that nearly all of the people who are being are refugees from this area are heading towards Russia because mm -hmm. that's where they're going to be safe. Mm -hmm. And that the majority of the shelling is coming from Ukrainian forces and the majority of dead are the people who are the inhabitants and civilians in eastern Ukraine. And despite that, we have these kind of declarations mm -hmm. from the United States. And um, as I say, uh, this is an extremely dangerous situation because we haven't gotten involved this close to the Soviet Union before. Um, it reminds me, and it makes me pretty old, but it really reminds me of the lead up to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. This is that close we're talking about right on the border of Russia, putting our weapons um, and trying to create you know, have domination in that country, whereas, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, that was um, 90 miles away. Right. Um, so... There's a huge amount yeah. of suffering in, uh, in Ukraine that you talk about, but there's also, it's hard to believe it happened so recently, but it was just last month, too, that the, the uh, attacks at the, on the Charlie Hebdo... Yeah, yeah uh, right. Uh, there's a lot of chaos going on, yeah. and a lot of different forces here, and Islamic forces are becoming stronger in Europe. And, um, you know, some of that is due to pretty extreme repression of Islamic immigrants in France uh, particularly, but in other areas. And as people remember, and again, because this has become mo so much of a free speech issue, it's something I felt like, even though it seems like the issue has been beat to death in the media about the attacks on uh, Charlie Hebdo, it was, I think, a weekly uh, magazine of uh, satire and political commentary. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a great outpouring of support, not just for free speech, but for that particular magazine. Um, the, the, the rallying call, in many cases, was a uh, Je suis Charlie. Right. Je My French is terrible, so pardon me. Je suis. Je suis. Uh, oh, okay. Charlie. We'll work it. Right. I am Charlie. Uh -huh. um, which I thought was interesting because, first of all, this was participated in, and you know, I mean, it was a terrible thing, and a yeah, number right. of people were killed. Yeah. It's a real serious incident. It is a significant blow at free speech. But the people coming out there and the world leaders coming out there are in countries which have done quite the same thing to reporters, some during acts of war, some of them quite openly censorship in their country or persecution of reporters. But more than that, and that's been talked about a little bit, the thing that I find interesting and why I felt I wanted to bring this up is a, is a different aspect not just of the opposition to this. I don't support killing people because of the content of their speech, and I wouldn't support the government shutting down uh, Charlie Hebdo, right. not by any means. We tolerate and should tolerate a lot of really offensive speech. But that thing, je suis Charlie, mm -hmm. I, it reminds me of an, an example. Um, if people remember Larry Flint, the publisher mm -hmm. of oh, Hustler yeah. magazine oh, yeah. in the United States, in 1978, he was the subject of an assassination attack for the offensive stuff he published. And good Lord, it is offensive yeah, yeah. and yeah. continues to be. There's no question about that. It's very offensive content on a, on a number of grounds. But it was also very political, and a lot of it was his satire. And he mm -hmm. took many, um, sometimes progressive political stands, right. sometimes not. He's but Yeah, he's very much a libertarian, um, uh, but used that kind of critical thing. So here was a situation where he was attacked for his views. It's clearly a um, thing against free speech, which is something he cared very much about. They're Supreme Court opinions based on his magazine. Mm -hmm. They're actually very important opinions. Um, nobody protested that by saying, I am Larry I Flint. Flint. <laughs> right. You know, can you yeah. even imagine right. anybody protesting that and saying, I am Larry Flint. <laughs> the identity with the people publishing that thing is a very, very different thing than rightly defending their freedom of speech. Right. And people should realize the cartoons and the things and like that in Charlie Hebdo are truly incredibly offensive yeah. and not just to certain people. Um, I, w I wouldn't even describe some of the mm -hmm. ways in which the prophet was, it wasn't just he appeared in the cartoons, but in ways that were right, right. extremely offensive to anybody that we would, if Jehovah were uh, done in the same way, which I think Larry Flint did, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we would also be very offended. There is also a difference between afflicting the comfortable, as they say. Right. In other words, uh, yeah. gaining satire against the powerful right. and afflicting 
those who are already the subject of repression and racism. Right. To, to depict them in that way is much more offensive and much more serious. And when we see people identifying with a publication like that, I think it's a serious attack on the religious freedom, the rights, the, the economic situation of um, Islamic uh, refugees, mm -hmm. basically, in France and elsewhere. Um, it takes us back to something else, which I, I still wouldn't say that the government should shut down, but if you take a look at magazines and cartoons in the 1930s and be earlier than that and stuff like that here in this country, the really? basis of Africa, well, I was oh. thinking more of the depiction of African oh, Americans yeah, yeah. as uh, monkeys. That was very common. The depiction of, of Jews in many state places was mm -hmm. extremely offensive. The depiction of Chinese and, and all that coming to this country earlier, these were extremely racist cartoons mm -hmm. in a sense that fortunately we made some progress. At least that kind of blatant, obnoxious, um, disgusting racism is not out there in major publications mm -hmm. and cartoons. That's a positive thing. Yeah. And for the people to start identifying with people who do pretty much the same in thing is a, is a, is a dangerous trend, I think. So there, are co there are posters appearing now in the United States uh, playing off the Je suis Charlie. <laughs> they say Je suis Michael, Je suis Trayvon, oh, Je right. suis, you know, right. uh, yeah. Akai, and uh, various other, you know, uh, Tamir. So yeah. uh, I want to just want to comment on the yeah. local um, media environment or the yeah. current media environment, too, when you mentioned Larry Flint. Uh, due to other sources for the m content right. of Hustler magazine, it's going to cease publication in this paper form pretty soon. So, so, so we won't have Hustler kick around. Uh, no, no, no not, not, not in paper. So not, no, I, 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 I think, you know, there's other examples. The uh, assassination attempt on George Wallace also. Mm -hmm. People in the North didn't say, ah, I am George Wallace. We just so let, no. Yeah, let me just transition to our, <laughs> our last. But it seems like the theme of this show and every show uh, is, uh, every show with you two, is a, a balance between the news that we're not getting at all and the news that we're getting sort of inundated with without being told the real story. Yeah, yeah. And so right. that's a nice right. transition yeah. to your sort of media propaganda and self-defense point. We've been we finishing finished. our shows recently and when I go through my list of 10 media propaganda, concrete tips to pr protect yourself against media propaganda. And this, this uh, month I'm combining number seven and number eight. Number seven is uh, interrog interrogate yourself as you read and watch the news and related to number seven is number eight, work on your ABCs. Now what do I mean by that? Uh, when I say interrogate yourself as you read or watch, um, what I'm encouraging people to do is to notice as you consume news or as you read things or look at things, whether it's alternative, quote unquote, or mainstream or corporate, uh, be aware for yourself, what do you find easily digestible? What do you find believable? What do you find offensive? What do you find, uh, and, and then it, when I say interrogate yourself, I mean, um, when you say, when you laugh at something, whether it's a joke in the locker room or in the, cl in the, at lunch with your friends, why are you laughing? Why is that funny? Are other people laughing? Who's not present? Who wouldn't be laughing? Those kind of things. As you um, are offended by something, why are you offended? What is it about that piece of information in the news that you're finding troublesome or uh, attractive? And those are the kind of things that require some work to go inside and say, what kind of propaganda do I have lodged in my head that maybe I should start questioning? Related to that, when I say work on your ABCs, by ABC, the propaganda ABCs I refer to are, are attitudes, beliefs, and conceptions about the world. This is where I think a lot of people, especially the more privileged you are in a social hierarchy, we need to really work on uh, the, 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 the ideologies and the ideas, the deep-seated ones, the racist ideas, the sexist ideas, the ideas about good, bad, us, them, uh, uh, what's valid, what's not valid, what's important, what's not important, the kind of things we talk about on this show all the time. Those are things that are lodged in our heads, so when we see a headline, is it surprising to us? Why is this on the front page? Why do we accept that? Why do we not accept that? That's our propaganda ABCs at work, that our attitudes, beliefs, and conceptions about the world, some of which, I'm suggesting, are not coming from our own free world, but have been imposed on us by the various or more than one of the doctrinal institutions that work on us all the time, school, church, family, advertising industry, and of course, media. So the, the, the two tips this month that I'm, I'm combining are interrogate yourself 
and say, why am I reacting this way? Would everybody react this way? What is it about me that gives me the, my response to this? And then go further and actively interrogate or uh, investigate your own ABCs, your attitudes, beliefs, and conceptions about the world. So you say, this is how I understand things. Is that really what I want to be thinking and doing? And that's, uh, those are my tips for this month and how to defend yourself against media propaganda. Someone I, someone I admire very much uh, has said many times, uh, don't believe everything you think. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just yes. leave it to who's, who well, that I'm, might be. And that's a really, I mean, I'm in the bumper sticker business. I make buttons and bumper stickers <laughs> for my day job. But, so it's always hard to condense complex ideas down. Mm -hmm. In fact, I usually argue in favor of complexity. But the right. idea of not believing everything you think really is the essence of this tip. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, because we do have ideas, um, some, some things scare us. Some things attract us. Some right. things, uh, s some people, when you look at them on the news, some people look friendly. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying they are, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like uh, when politicians speak, they might sound reasonable. Mm -hmm. But like Dave was saying, don't then go and say, this is what they believe. Mm -hmm. All mm -hmm. you know is what they said. Mm -hmm. right. And then you look at their record, because we do also know what they do. Mm -hmm. but, right. but to conflate what's coming out of somebody's mouth, especially somebody in a position of, of political power, uh, who has every motivation to paint as positively as possible whatever it is they're doing by good words, you know, and, and they, in fact, they employ public relations professionals to help them do it. Yes. So all we can report and all we can ask our media to do is report on what people say and then report on what they do, right. what they believe, what they think, right. what they feel, right. that we aren't privy to. No. Only the people really closest to them are right. privy to that, if then, right. and, and, uh, and they aren't usually talking to the media. So, right. so uh, I think it's really important for us to, to really um, be aware that all of us, it, propaganda isn't just something that happens to us, right. it's something that uh, we participate in on to some level. And that's, that's the essence of my right. tip this month is to say, what's my role in this propaganda system? W what am I swallowing that I should be right. not swallowing? Right. And to evaluate you know, your own beliefs versus what you hear, um, what you hear from people around you, probably the very best thing is action. Mm -hmm. Because that's where you Absolutely. gain the experience and begin to evaluate it. You can get a very different impression of what's going on in the world if you're involved in it. Yes. They say the world belongs to those who show up, but mm -hmm. showing up does an awful lot to influence the, the knowledge that you have of the world and how it works. And right. so for this show, we discuss thoughts and ideas and media, but those kind of actions are what really deepens or changes mm -hmm. your perspective on things. So we encourage the show to, to lead to that because and without that, we're just sitting here talking. Yeah. And, and we can end there. That's, that will do it for our show tonight. <laughs> thank you, Dave. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for tuning in. You can find and thanks us. Thanks to Dave Garland you for can, doing yeah, the technical. Thank you, Dave and Garland. And thanks to Suzanne Linton for and the And thank you, Suzanne. You can find the show on the web at ourworldtodaytv.org.